we're talking about Soaz, and we're just kind of screwing around because I've got a new toy, a new technique for showing you stuff, and I'm curious to just see what you think about it. So we've got a virtual anatomical model. We're gonna have it standing three-dimensionally in the room, and we're gonna do a tour and just some off-the-cuff anatomy exploration of the psoas. Won't you join me? We have our anatomical model this time, and we're talking about psoas. Why does this muscle hold so much mystique for so many different therapists? So when you look at this muscle, we have, you know, a, a an origin at the lumbar spine, okay? Coming down through the pelvis, moving from posterior to anterior, forming into a tendon and connecting to the lesser tuberosity of the femur. All in all, not much different than say your bicep or any muscle. I mean, it's, I don't really understand why people think that this muscle holds so much sway over so much. At the same time, every muscle in the body is important and has a role. The psoas, I think, just gets a lot of excessive, <laughs> is that the right word? Uh, excessive attention. It's not your psoas. It's not your psoas. It's not your psoas. Like 90% of the time. And when people say that this muscle is tight, or they say that it's you know, the leading cause of back pain, or that you can, you know, that you can even reach this thing. Okay, you look at how deep that muscle is in the body. And keep in mind that we have a huge amount of tissue stripped off of this model. So over this section, and you can say CQL there, quadratus lumborum is right there. Okay, these are gonna be your back extensors. And then you have some of the, uh, you know, accessory muscles of the spine. But when you look at this muscle, you have to imagine that what we have going on in here is all of our intestines. And so anytime somebody says from the anterior approach that they can reach this muscle, I have to, I have to doubt their anatomical knowledge because there's a huge amount of tissue to work through from the side there to get. Okay, I have an approach that I teach and use that actually comes at, instead of you know coming in this way, you actually come in laterally. I don't know that this is an even better approach, but it's the one I use because it at least makes more anatomical sense than trying to dive into all of this. All right, so let's talk about some of these nerves that we see. One of the things you may notice is we have a nerve, that's the gentofemoral nerve, actually penetrating right through the muscle. Now you may be like, well, I didn't even know that. Well, here's a real, here's a real eye opener, is that in most people, there's a study in, I think 63, I'll post it here, the 63 uh, specimens, uh, 61 of them, the entire lumbar plexus was actually contained inside this muscle. So the nerves that are actually, you know, branching out from the, the spine here, you can see a little bit, actually enter in to the psoas and penetrate through it. Not around it, not in front of it, but actually penetrate through it, much like you see right here. Now, what does that mean when it comes to working with the psoas? How does this open up our ideas about what it means for nerve pain or muscle tightness? And if this, these nerves, you know, if the entire lumbar plexus is being squeezed every time you flex your hip, why don't you get shooting pain down your leg? Now, I want you to legitimately think about this because it's an honest concern. And keep in mind that this is the lumbar plexus. These aren't even the nerves that are directly innervating psoas. So they are actually these, you know, the femoral nerve, all the stuff that's coming down through the leg. This big nerve here, don't get confused. That is actually the sciatic nerve. So we're at, that's actually posterior side back here. We're talking about the anterior nerves that come all through the front and side of your leg. When we talk about psoas, we need to be thinking in anatomical terms and whether or not physiologically our explanations make sense. 
What are some of the things that can go on with psoas? So polio is actually a really good example of one of the structural functions or structural side effects is you can get atrophy inside of psoas and all of these muscles, iliacus and, well, we took out the glutes, but through the glutes and the entire leg. I mean, that's kind of what polio does is it causes uh, myelitis and uh, muscle wasting eventually. And so what happens if you lose your psoas is your spine will actually do something like this. And you'll get a bend or a curve because there is no muscular stability on one side. Now that is a legitimate thing, but in a healthy adult, we're not talking about muscle weakness or absence or you know an absence of a muscle or a profound weakness. That's what I wanna say. A lot of therapists will come at this and say, oh, you need to stretch this muscle, okay? Because when we sit, when we sit, it's all contracted up. Now I want you to pay attention to where this muscle body is as compared to where it's, you know, how it runs through here. We have sort of a natural curvature. Now, if you picture that femur, you know, flexed up, how much does the psoas actually have to contract? I mean, kind of think about your bicep. If your bicep is here and you just flex your arm and you let your arm rest on a desk, would your bicep get sore? I don't really think it would. And so when we blame sitting for psoas pain, that becomes an issue for me. What else can we talk about here? Now, one of the major issues that I've found in psoas has less to do with it being tight and more with it being weak. An easy test for this is actually just to flex your knee and then once you get it to that sort of that top is to actually bring it up above your waist, hyperflexion if you will, because that's where psoas starts to really truly engage, okay? Kind of leveraging that thigh up up very high. You can have somebody push down or just see how long you can hold it here. I'm gonna wager that you're going to start feeling some burning either kind of in your abdomen, like a runner's stitch, or you're gonna have some muscle twitching here along the side of the leg, up into the glute, as some of these accessory muscles try to help out. Okay, we'll do, we'll do two variations here. If you wanna stretch this, it's a very simple stretch. It's Cobra Pose from yoga. And you do have to be conscious using Cobra Pose. You know, anytime you're going to do an extreme motion, which Cobra Pose is, um, you're going to hyperflex the lumbar spine. Okay, so you're gonna be hyperflexing this. So if there's lumbar spine sensitivity, somebody has, you know, fusion or what have you through here, that might be something that they need to be approached with caution. It doesn't mean they can't do it, but it should be approached with caution. And that will effectively stretch psoas, like no problem. It's one of the most effective stretches that you can do. Now, what about strengthening? Well, our, our, our man here could just do mountain climbers. Mountain climbers are fantastic strengthening exercises for the psoas. Anything that brings that leg up above that, you know, the 90 degrees of hip flexion, you know, up toward the abdomen, is going to strengthen psoas. If psoas can flex the leg, what else can it do? Well, it can flex the torso. Okay, so if the leg is stationary and these points are brought into tension, that is going to cause the torso to bend forward. So when you bend forward into an L shape or a right angle, that's gonna be your psoas helping out. Is it a prime mover in these motions? Probably not, okay? One of these things that this area, because of its, you know, because of its anatomical weakness here, what is the anatomical weakness of this section of the body? Is that it only has this bony attachment. And when I say only, I mean, the lumbar spine is incredibly strong, but there's a lot of muscular bracing that goes on in the abdomen. And so very few things in this girdle, okay, around the abdominals, act in isolation. They're all attached to everything. You think about the abdominals, they start back here and they flow all the way from the spine, all the way around to, you know, this line, the linea aspa in the beginning or in the, in the front. So from, you know, the xiphoid process, you know, follow the linea aspa down, it's gonna connect here and that's where your abdominals would be. 
Did you guys dig that? I hope that you did because I love this way of being able to give you a tour and kind of on the fly platter on. And I know that I, I talk a lot. I, I just want to give you information and sometimes I just have a lot of thoughts in my head and I want this to be playful. I want it to be something where we're just exploring and learning together. And sometimes I'm gonna miss a landmark or not know what something's called. And that's fine. That's what this is. It's a knowledge exchange. And what about that thing with the lumbar plexus? Have you ever heard that? Have you ever heard it in mentioned anywhere that your entire lumbar plexus, the entire thing is actually bound up inside of your psoas or actually puncturing through it. So every time you're flexing that muscle, major nerves that innervate your entire lower limb are being squeezed and pulled and twisted on. Okay. That, that's kind of, it was mind blowing to me. I, I really enjoyed this and I'm so glad that I found that study. It's linked down there in the comments or in the description. If you like this, you know what to do. If you want to see more, same thing. And other than that, I think we're getting, we're winding down. If you've got a question, you want me to explore another area, now is the time, okay? Where do I see you? I see you on the dip side. No, wait, that didn't work. Dip side, no, oh, oh, I'm a dip. It's flip side.